Hey guys, it's been way longer than usual uh, since my last video, and definitely way longer than I had intended. There have been a lot of factors in the past couple of months that have made it more difficult for me to complete and upload these videos. Many of these factors have just been things in my personal life, though there have been quite a few issues on the technical, behind-the-scenes side of things as well, some of which I would like to share with you all here. As many of you may recall, I had previously stated that a video on the topic of Ben's role in Season 2 uh, has been high up on my priority list. Well, in June, I started writing the script for that video, and as I feared, it quickly became obscenely long. Because in order to explain what I feel Ben was up to when he was captured, I first felt the need to go over many other details regarding his perspective on things. It ended up getting to the point where I felt that more of the script was spent setting up this topic versus actually addressing it. So I decided I needed to break that video up into three different videos. And then shortly after that, three became five. The thing about Lost and all of its mysteries is just how interconnected it all is. It has always been difficult for me to address one specific topic without going on a bunch of other tangents. And now these videos have progressed to a point where it's getting more and more necessary to address certain areas of the show before diving into other areas. So over the past couple months, I've been trying to sort of roughly map out the next several videos so that there's more of an episodic flow to them. And at the same time that I've been trying to outline the more immediate future of this series, I've also felt that it was time to shake up the format a bit. I've long been aware that it isn't much fun for you guys to watch me stand in front of a blackboard and try to read my terrible handwriting. So starting with this video, I wanted to sort of transition more towards me narrating over elements that are more visually interesting, including footage from the show. There will still be a bit of me in front of the camera Dharma style, but those segments will no longer make up the bulk of the video. I've also foregone the use of the chalkboard for the time being, though I may still use it from time to time in future videos if I feel it might be useful. I think in the long run, this slightly altered format will improve the quality of these videos. Unfortunately, for this first video, this has been a huge adjustment for me on the editing side of things. So I do apologize in advance for those quality issues. But on the subject of apologies, I did also want to say sorry specifically to my Patreon supporters. In return for your guys' donations, I do feel I owe you content, at least on a monthly basis. So I do feel especially bad for this delay when it comes to you guys. In particular, two of my newest Patreon supporters as they are a couple months overdue for their shoutouts and thank yous. Those two are Chuck Boyd and Jeffrey Winslow. Jeffrey signed up for the $4 level, which comes with a candidate number. He has chosen the number 108, and he has been added to the Cave of Names. Thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you, Chuck for your support, and for your patience. With all of that said, I think I'll spare you guys the typical support the channel spiel, given that this intro is already over long. So without further ado, let's get lost. Once you leave, you'll never be able to get back here. They knew it was out there somewhere, but they just couldn't find it. But you'll never find it. 
this fellow presumed, and correctly as it turned out, that the island was always moving. It took him like 20 years to find this place the first time. I'll start holding my breath now. Unfortunately, these windows don't stay open for very long. I'm here to tell you that the island won't let you come alone. The island is well established as being difficult to find. Yet, in spite of this, we know of several instances in which individuals or groups arrived on the island seemingly by accident. Prior to the 21st century, we know of three shipwrecks that occurred. The first took place approximately 2,000 years ago when a group of ancient Romans arrived on the island. The second one we know of came about in the mid-1800s when the Black Rock was swept inland. And the third was in 1988 when Danielle Rousseau and her research team ran aground. Now it is hinted that other groups likely arrived on the island throughout this time frame of thousands of years besides just the three we know about. That man who sent you to kill me believes that everyone is corruptible because it's in their very nature to sin. I bring people here to prove him wrong. Before you brought my ship, there were others? Yes, many. But given the vast expanse of time, this was still probably a relatively infrequent occurrence. However, that suddenly changes around the start of the 21st century. Over a period of less than four years, there were four crashes on the island. Desmond's ship, the Elizabeth, the Nigerian plane, Henry Gale's balloon, and Oceanic Flight 815. Statistically speaking, this short period represents an extremely dramatic spike in crashes on the island. Could there be something behind this significant increase? Let's review what we know about each of these crashes and see if we can find a potential explanation. Around the year 2000, Desmond Hume is released from military prison. He finds Charles Widmore waiting for him. You want a ride? Not with you. Get in the car. Whitmore reveals that he prevented his daughter Penelope from receiving Desmond's letters from jail, and that she has now moved on and is engaged to another man. Charles then offers Desmond a significant amount of money to stay away from Penny. This is for your new life, away from my daughter. The conditions are simple. No contact, no calls, no post. You just run away, Desmond. Desmond refuses the money, yet stays away from Penny anyways, likely due to a combination of not wanting to jeopardize her happiness and his own demonstrated pattern of running away. Desmond then decides he's going to enter the sailing race sponsored by Widmore in an attempt to reclaim his honor. The only issue is he's apparently $42,000 shy of being able to afford the necessary type of boat. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I've, I've just arrived and uh, I spent all my American money on a taxi. I've got it. I don't suppose you have 42,000 more of those, do you? Depends on what it's for. Fortunately though, almost immediately after arriving in the US, he meets a woman who just so happens to have exactly the type of boat he needs and is generously willing to let him use it in the race. And what's a 42 grand for? As of yet, I don't actually have a boat. I have a boat. I want you to have it. Which he does when the race begins approximately eight months later. I've got eight months to get into the best shape of my life. 
At some point during his trip across the Pacific, Desmond encounters a storm and is knocked unconscious. He wakes up on the shore of the island, where he is discovered by Kelvin. Desmond then spends about three years in the hatch before becoming responsible for the electromagnetic event that causes 815 to crash. And then, two months after that, he turns the failsafe key and causes another electromagnetic event, which this time makes the island's location visible to the outside world. Around 2001, Echo and his associates are posing as priests in order to smuggle a large quantity of heroin out of Nigeria. Echo's brother Yemi arrives on the tarmac with military in tow. No! 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 Yimmy is shot in the crossfire before being loaded onto the plane. Echo is left behind as the plane escapes. We know this plane, its occupants, and its cargo all end up on the island in the South Pacific. But this raises a lot of questions. Perhaps chief among them is how that's even possible, given that a plane of that size only has a range of approximately 1,200 miles, and the distance from Nigeria to the South Pacific is about 10 times that. Along the same lines, why on earth would it be headed in that direction? Especially given that the map that Boone finds seems to suggest the plane was headed north toward the Sahara Desert. Indeed, this would be the most logical direction for the plane to be headed, as Tunisia, which is directly north of Nigeria, has several ports to Europe. Somewhere around this time period, a man named Henry Gale crashed his hot air balloon on the island. We know he had a significant other named Jennifer, based on the note he wrote on a $20 bill. We also know he was from Minnesota, based on his driver's license. We can infer that Ben and or his people found and interrogated Henry, based on the fact that Ben clearly referred to such personal details while pretending to be the balloonist. My name is Henry Gale. I'm from Minnesota. And Jennifer thought it would be neat. We can further surmise that the others are responsible for Henry's death, either directly or indirectly, based on the fact that Ben tried to lie to Saeed and claim that Henry died in the crash. Four months ago, I was part of the search party. Henry Gale was hanging out of the basket, neck broken. So he was already dead? Yes. You really should have checked his wallet before you did that. Jennifer. So tell me, how did Henry Gale write a note to his wife with a broken neck? It wasn't me. I didn't kill him. <laughs> You don't understand. How did you know his wife's name? Did you interrogate him? The last, but perhaps most important thing that we know about Henry and his balloon is that they were somehow connected to Widmore Industries, as a logo for Widmore Labs can be seen on the balloon. The reasonable assumption here seems to be that Charles Widmore was funding Henry Gale's journey over the Pacific, much like he was sponsoring the sailing race Desmond had entered. 
Henry's Minnesota driver's license says it expired in 2003. Since Minnesota licenses expire once every four years on the driver's birthday, this would mean Henry's was issued at some point in 1999 and expired on June 11, 2003. This suggests Henry's disappearance occurred during this window. I am aware that the $20 bill Henry used to write his note belongs to the newer series that began circulating in October of 2003. Some people take this to mean Henry must have arrived on the island sometime after October 2003. This assessment is fair and perfectly sound, and I certainly wouldn't claim it is wrong. That said, it is not an assessment I feel compelled to share, and I do feel the need to explain why that is. The reality of producing a television show, especially one with such a tight schedule, is that not every little detail will be perfect. There will always be minute mistakes and errors visible on screen if you look carefully enough. One such mistake occurs in the Season 2 episode, What Kate Did. In one of her flashbacks, Kate is seen attempting to purchase a train ticket shortly after murdering her father. She is then apprehended by U.S. Marshal Edward Mars in their first ever encounter. We know the Marshal was chasing Kate for three years prior to the crash of 815. Well, somewhere along the way during the three years that I was chasing her... Which places this scene at the train station around 2001. And yet, if we look at the money Kate presents to purchase a ticket, we can see the same type of $20 bill Henry's note was written on. The one that wasn't actually introduced until October 2003. I point to this anachronism as evidence that the production team clearly did not choose this series of $20 bill with its print date in mind. If we can dismiss the train station example as a production error, and we kind of have to, then I would argue it's more than reasonable to conclude the Henry example may have been as well. Personally, I feel the specific information printed on the license should be regarded as the far more deliberate and therefore valuable, piece of information provided by the storytellers. Once again, that's not to say anyone else's interpretation of Henry Gale's timeline is wrong. I am merely addressing this in order to clarify why I feel my interpretation of the timeline, in which Henry arrived around 2001, is not contradicted by the presence of this particular $20 bill. As for Oceanic Flight 815, we know it was en route from Sydney to Los Angeles when about six hours into the flight, the plane lost communication. It was at this point the pilot changed course in order to head for Fiji. Six hours in. Our radio went out. No one could see us. We turned back to, to land in Fiji. By the time we... We hit turbulence. We were a thousand miles off course. Two hours after this, Oceanic 815 came into proximity of the island just as Desmond's failure to push the button created an electromagnetic event that caused the plane to split apart. We were flying for two hours in the wrong direction. They don't know where to look. Less than three months later, the staged wreckage of a decoy 815 is discovered in the Sunda Trench. It is eventually confirmed that Charles Widmore is responsible for staging this wreckage. What have I told you? The plane was a fake. An elaborate, expensive fake. How would you know that? Because I put it there. The real Oceanic Flight 815 crashed on an island, a special island, with unique scientific properties. In this scene, Charles has even gone so far as to indicate he's fully aware of where the real plane ended up, and that this was his reason for staging the wreckage in the first place. While reviewing this cluster of crashes, you may have noticed a name that came up again and again. 
Charles Widmore was banished from the island by Vin around 1993. At that time, he more or less threatened vengeance upon Vin. I'll be seeing you, boy. Years later, he also expresses his intention to reclaim the island as his own. That island's mine, Benjamin. It always was. It will be again. It therefore stands to reason that Widmore's subsequent funding of adventures across the Pacific, such as Desmond's and Henry's, may have been in an effort to locate the island. Consider the following hypothetical scenario. Charles Widmore takes steps to secretly track the participants in each of his sailing races. When Desmond goes missing in 2001, Widmore then funds Henry Gale's trip across the Pacific, in the process ensuring the charted course takes the balloon through the same region Desmond disappeared in. If Widmore tracks the balloon, and it too goes missing in that same area, this would more or less verify the approximate location of the island. Now let's look at this scenario from Ben's perspective. We know the others were able to monitor the Swan Station using the Pearl surveillance. So it is perfectly reasonable to expect they would learn of Desmond's arrival in the Swan. At which point, just a little bit of research would likely turn up news stories about Desmond Hume, the man who went missing in the Pacific during a sailing race. From there, they could research Desmond more thoroughly, the way they do later with the 815ers. At this point, if they hadn't already discovered it in the news, the others would no doubt realize Widmore had funded the race. Then, a short time later, Henry Gale arrives. The others intercept him and discover the Widmore logo on the balloon. They interrogate Henry. Now, perhaps he was as unaware of Widmore's agenda as Desmond was. Nothing more than a pawn used by Charles. Or perhaps he was more like Naomi, an actual agent, fully aware of his trip's true purpose. Personally, I feel the note to Jennifer seems to suggest the former, but we really can't say for sure. Regardless, Henry ends up dead, either executed for his suspected motives or somehow killed in a frightened escape attempt. At this point, the others would have good reason to fear Widmore now knows their location, and this would call for the drastic measure of moving the island. In previous videos, I've noted that Ben seems to have moved the island before, that is, prior to when we see him move it in Season 4. This is based on his familiarity with the chamber, as well as his interaction with the Tunisian hotel clerk. Is this your first time in Tunisia? I now propose that it was the successive arrivals of Desmond and Henry that were the catalyst for Ben's first time moving the island. We know that by turning the wheel, a person is engaging the pocket of negatively charged exotic matter in such a way that it generates a very large, albeit very brief, wormhole. This wormhole quickly expands to engulf the perimeter of the island's electromagnetic field before collapsing. In the process, it seems to transport the island to an unpredictable location in space, but a fixed place in time, that being more or less the present. At the center of this wormhole, however, the effect seems to be inverted for the person generating it. They are transported to a fixed location in space, that is, the exit in the Sahara Desert, but an unpredictable place in time. This is evidenced in Season 4 by Ben arriving 10 months in the future and being uncertain of the year. Today's date is... October 24th, sir. 2005. Yes, sir. 2005. As well as Locke later arriving in 2007 and being shocked the Oceanic Six have been back for three years. All your friends who left the island... I've been back three years. Three years. So continuing on with our hypothetical scenario, what if upon moving the island, 
Ben arrived at the exit at the point in 2001, right when the Nigerian Beechcraft was passing over on its way to Tunisia. This, then, would have likely resulted in the plane crossing that rift in space-time to the island on the other side, causing it to suddenly appear above the Orchid Station before the resulting turbulence caused it to crash. Now let's put ourselves in Ethan's shoes. Your leader, Ben, has just moved the island to protect it because two separate people had recently been sent to the island by Charles Widmore. And now you witness this plane crash landing in the distance. When you reach the plane, you see a man who, at a glance, appears to be climbing down from the plane. Others on board. You don't understand. I didn't come on that plane. Wrong answer. No, wait, stop, stop. My name is John Locke. I know this is going to be hard to understand, but Ben Linus appointed me as your leader. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Goodbye, John Locke. Given the current threat level and apparent pattern of Widmore agents being sent to the island, Ethan's hostile demeanor makes a lot of sense. And setting aside this newcomer's bizarre lie, the fact that he knows the name Benjamin Linus at all seemingly confirms he's an agent of Widmore. But when this man vanishes into thin air, and no one else from the plane survived, the Beechcraft would likely be written off as one last failed attempt to infiltrate the island just before it was moved. But what about Oceanic 815? Did it somehow fit into Whitmore's machinations? He did, after all, seem very certain of where it really ended up. This will be the topic of our next video, along with a closer look at Whitmore's plans and motives leading up to the freighter being sent to the island. Until then, namaste and good luck. Oh, hello there. If you're like me, you can't get enough of Lost. So if you'd like to be notified when more videos like this one arrive, just click right up here to subscribe. In the meantime, if you'd like to check out other videos like this one, just click right up here. Or if you'd like to check out a fun talk show filmed in an abandoned Dharma broadcast station, just click right over here. And as always, remember that this channel is like the island. It wants you to come back.